Hi, I'm Daniel Chan from UNSW Sydney. Welcome to another adventure in pure mathematics. In this video, I want to talk about the Riemann rock space and show how it's useful in the study of algebraic geometry. I then want to talk about some subtleties that are involved in trying to study the Riemann rock space and these subtleties will motivate uh, the introduction of a rather sophisticated tool called cohomology, which is the theme of this uh, playlist. Okay, so what's our starting data? We're going to start here with x, so some sort of quasi-projective variety over field k here, and d is going to be some uh, divisor on x, okay? So it's just a linear combination of co-dimension one sub-varieties. Okay, so what's the Riemann rock space? It's really something that hopefully uh, you've kind of seen before. Uh, so uh, there are various ways to uh, define it. So it depends on the D and the X, okay? So typical notation is it's this L of T. So firstly, we can do it in terms of this associated um, uh, sheaf of rational functions, O of D, and we can look at the global sections of this. So this is some sort of coherent sheaf. Okay, and so global sections, there are various ways to think about what this means. Okay, one thing is that if you have a sheaf, remember you can talk about sections over op any open set. So global means that you pick the open set, which is the whole of the space, X in this case. Another way uh, uh, that's very good to think about what is this global section is it's just the homomorphisms from the structure sheaf O into that coherent sheaf here. Okay, and the last one, and this is the one that we'll use for today, um, is uh, in this particular case, since this involves a, a, a sheaf of rational functions, okay, uh, we can write this as certain actual rational functions, okay, f, and which rational functions are they? They're the rational functions such that the divisor associated to that, if you add it to d, is greater than or equal to zero. So that's more or less. Uh, uh, true by the definition of what this O of D is. So if you don't know what this definition is, this perhaps is the thing that you can take for this L of D. Okay, uh, a little bit more notation that's involved with this. Okay, so this is going to be, of course, some sort of a vector space over K. And as a vector space, you can talk about its dimension. Okay, so uh, the dimension, uh, what we'll often do is that when we change this big H0 to little h, we're talking about a numerical invariant, and that numerical invariant is the dimension of this um, global sections of this O of D. Okay, so I would have, uh, if you've seen my uh, playlist on a user's guide to coherent sheaves, you would have seen why uh, looking at global sections of things like this uh, is going to be important. So when D is actually a Cartier divisor, this is going to be a line bundle, and then you're just looking at uh, global sections of line bundles. So they're important for giving maps. So let me give you a little proposition which shows you quite specifically how we can use it, okay? So let's suppose now X is a smooth projective curve. And we're just going to pick a point P on X. Okay, so that's going to be, uh, in particular, a divisor on this X here because this is a curve. So this is curve dimension 1. And let's suppose we're in this situation where H0 of P is greater than or equal to 2. In other words, when you look at um, this space here, where this D is just P, so the divisors of F, look at all these rational functions, such as divisors of F plus this P is greater than or equal to 0, the dimension of that is at least 2. Once you have this piece of information, just this numerical piece of information, you know straight away, uh, if you also know x is a smooth projective curve, that x is actually isomorphic to P1. Okay, so this is a rather uh, interesting and useful fact in algebraic geometry as well. So let me just show you how that works and emphasize what's going on here. Okay, so, um, and, and the thing here, of course, is that remember global sections here, so in, in particular, these rational functions, they give you maps. That's the idea, and that's the map we're going to use to construct this isomorphism. Okay, so here you have h0 of p is greater than or equal to 2, so this is at least two-dimensional. This space here is at least two-dimensional when you have uh, d equals p here. Okay, so the first thing is that, well, if you pick a constant function, the divisor of a constant function, there are no zeros, no poles, so that's going to be zero, so of course p is greater than or equal to zero, so you have constant functions. So that's those constant functions inside k, that gives you uh, some subspace of this, and that's always the case because this p uh, is uh, effective, okay, as a divisor, so you always have this h0 is always at least one. But this is at actually at least two. So you can find a non-constant rational function, f here, and uh, it's a non-constant rational function, and being non-constant, of course, that means that it's going to have a zero and a pole somewhere, okay? So um, 
Uh, so here we're talking about projective curves, so it has to have a pole somewhere if it's not constant. Okay, so the divisor of this f, it's inside here, so when you add p to it, it's greater than or equal to zero. So the only pole it can have is a single pole at p. So it'll have a single pole at p, so the divisor of f is the minus p. And the degree of this f has to be zero, okay? So that means there can only be a, a single zero elsewhere. Let's call it q, and so q doesn't equal p here if it's not constant. Okay, so the divisor of f equals q minus p. And this is a rational function on this x, okay? So um, basically, a rational function, it can take values at infinity, but that value of infinity, you can think of as a point on P1. So this gives you a map from x to P1. And that's a morphism that you get okay, from x to P1. And what do we know about this? Okay, so let's look about this. So remember that f has a single zero at q and a single pole at P. So that means the inverse image of infinity if you look at what gets sent to infinity, there's only one point that gets sent to infinity, that's a p. Uh, uh, okay, the only point that gets sent to infinity is p, and the only point that gets sent to zero is q. And more general, actually, and you can modify this argument accordingly by adding constants if you like, uh, the inverse image of any particular point is just a single point. Okay, so that means that really, okay, uh, this function is one to one, Okay, and um, also you can see that this is going to be surjective because the image is going to be, um, uh, uh, I, I guess there are various ways that you can see that, but uh, in particular for a curve, okay, or for P1, okay, you can think about, well, what types of um, sub-varieties do you have for that? There are the points, okay, um, or, or they're the whole thing, okay? So the image of this uh, is actually going to be constructible. It has to be the whole thing, okay, because of connectedness and the fact that you've got at least two points in there. Okay, so it's subjective, and um, since it's also a morphism of smooth curves, then it has to be an isomorphism, okay? So you can talk about the degree of this morphism. Like it's a morphism of uh, curves. So there's a, a degree that's involved there, okay? And the degree is given by the fact that, well, this since this is one-to-one, -one, okay? Uh, in general, even if they're not smooth, you, this will be generically one-to-one. -one. And um, this is generically one-to-one. -one. Um, because they're smooth, uh, if it's generically one-to-one -one and both of them are smooth, then this is actually an isomorphism. And that uh, proves this proposition. A rather wonderful result. And it really just it requires a little bit of information about this Riemann rock space. The dimension of this Riemann rock space, O of P, is O of D equals P here, the dimension of that is at least two. And once you know that, uh, you will have this result. Okay, so that means that really we want to study this Riemann rock space, uh, either this space of rational functions here, or you can think of it in these other incarnations, okay? And uh, let me just point out one very important subtlety that's involved when you try to study this, and that's very important in algebraic geometry. And that's the problem of lifting sections. Okay, so let's just go through this slowly and see what's involved here. Okay, so we're going to fix here now an invertible sheaf L here. So that's like O of D if D is a Cartier divisor. And remember, if uh, X is smooth, then all your V divisors, all these divisors are actually Cartier. Okay. Um, so what can you do? So the first thing is you can take this uh, invertible sheaf, okay, L. Okay, so remember, invertible sheaf corresponds to a line bundle. Okay, and what you can do is you can restrict this to a single point on this x. x here is still some quasi-projective variety. You restrict it to some x, okay? And so there are various ways of doing this. If you haven't seen this before, you can look at my playlist on the user's guide to coherent sheaves. Okay, so L tensor OX OP. So this is like a tensor product here. Uh, that's one way to think of it. You can restrict it to this P. And basically what it does is you've got a line bundle here. And remember a line bundle is essentially just a, um, a family of one dimensional vector spaces over K that vary across this X. So we're basically restricting to get one of those uh, one dimensional vector spaces that's above P. That's what we're doing. And when we do this L restricted to P, okay? So we want to think of this as a sheaf. So basically this sheaf is a skyscraper sheaf, which is that one dimensional vector space. Okay, supported at P and zero elsewhere. So that's this OP that you see here. Okay, so um, so this is what you get, and this is going to be surjective. Okay, you can see this quite uh, easily. Okay, uh, one way to do this is just by right exactness of um, tensor uh, product. Okay, so this is L tensor, the map from O to OP, and O to OP. Of course, this is just uh, you quotient out by the ideal. Of, um, 
function zero at p. Okay, so this is going to be a surjective map. Okay, so there you have a surjective map. Okay, and uh, this is going to be actually very important for us. Okay, uh, what can you do with this? So uh, remember, uh, this is a surjective map, so that means that for any open set of x, okay, you also have a map from here to here. And particularly if you look at x, okay, and see what happens, you get the global sections from the, okay, so you get h0 pi, you look at the um, sections of L on X, and that maps to the section of L restricted to P on X. And of course, remember, this is just a skyscraper sheaf, essentially, uh, uh, P. So this is isomorphic to K. And one of the things that's rather subtle is even though that this map here is surjective, this map on the global sections is not necessarily surjective. And uh, we'll see some examples of this later on, but uh, for the moment, this is just something that um, uh, I should I want to mention that uh, happens. Okay, so this is uh, something that's rather interesting that happens, and I want you to bear this in mind. And, and I will see in a moment why this is uh, a, uh, going to be something that uh, raises subtleties in algebraic geometry. Okay, so let's go back to the reason why we want to study global sections of uh, these line bundles is to construct maps. So let's recall how this works. So suppose you have S0 up to Sn, the global sections of this line bundle L. Okay, so what is the map that we get? So we potentially get a morphism from X to Pn in this case. We at least get a, bar, a, a, a rational map, okay, that's given by S0 up to Sn. That's the notation for it. And this is subjective for what it does. If you have a point X in this big X, okay, uh, where does it go to? Okay, so what you can do is that for this line bundle, you can look at, see what happens about the point X, okay, and that's going to be a one-dimensional vector space. So even though uh, it, it, you don't have actual values um, uh, inside this K here, okay, in that uh, one-dimensional vector space, you can look at S0 of X, S1 of X, all the way down to Sn of X, and you can compare the ratios between them. So that gives you a point of Pn, as long as all of these values are not zero. Okay, so if these, uh, so that's that's the prescription for this. Okay, and this is a very very simple sort of an idea, um, uh, although a little bit subtle, and shows how projective geometry is a lot more um, subtle than affine geometry. So remember, it's well defined. Basically, you need all of these to be zero, uh, non-zero. You can't have all of these to be zero, rather. Okay, so you need one of them to be non-zero. Because okay, so it's well defined that let's say x equal this p here. If and only if you can find one of these SIs, some SI of P, which is non-zero. Now watch is this SI of P. Well, SI is inside here, okay? Okay, and what you want to do is basically you want to say, okay, well, what's its value at this L restricted to P? And what that is, is it's just the image of this H0 of pi, uh, 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 under h0 of pi of this si. So h0 of pi, if you apply it to this si, it will land you inside here, which is isomorphic uh, to that. Essentially, this thing here is just the one-dimensional vector space sitting over Lp. So it's isomorphic to k, it's one-dimensional. Okay, And that is essentially this si of p. So you want this to be non-zero. Okay, So that's what you want. Of course, this is a map of vector spaces, okay? So you want something to hit something non-zero. Once it hits something that's non-zero, this map is surjective, okay? So this is the key point, okay, about this problem of lifting sections, why this is important, and why this raises subtleties in the study of uh, sheaves in algebraic geometry, or coherent sheaves in algebraic geometry. The criterion for si finding such an SI, if you want to find a set of these uh, SS, Okay, and you want to make sure that this is um, going to be well defined at a point, uh, point P. What do you need? You need to make sure that this H0 of pi, okay, is going to be surjective. So that's why it's important to show uh, that this, uh, uh, this uh, is going to be surjective. Okay, so, um, so unfortunately that is not always the case, and that's one of the subtleties of algebraic geometry. Okay, so let me just tell you about the name, problem of lifting sections. Why is it called that? So another way to think about this is that, well, uh, to be subjective means what? If you have something in here, okay, so that's a section here, you want to say it's hit by something in here. So it means you can lift it back up to here. 
So this is a section just of the thing when you restrict it at a point, and you want to lift it to something global, such that when it restricts to that point, it gives you what you want. So that's the problem of lifting sections. That's how you remember it. OK, so this should motivate uh, some of the study that I want to introduce in the rest of this playlist. OK, and uh, so, so I want to focus on some key questions. OK, so suppose now let's more generally not just look at this subjective map of coherent sheaves. Let's type any subjective map of coherent sheaves. Uh, uh, let's consider subjective. Okay, so the first question, of course, that we want to know is when is H0 of pi surjective? Okay, that's the first thing. Okay, when is it surjective? And if it's not surjective, well, how far are you off from being surjective? Well, there's, uh, the surjectivity is measured by the image, okay? So um, suppose you can't do that. Uh, you can't say when it's surjective or, you, you know, it's not surjective. Can you at least determine what's the image? Okay, that's uh, something that's important. Can you determine the image? Um, so another thing that you might want to do is you want to say, well, can you, you want to try to make the image big. Uh, another way of rephrasing that is you can look at the, uh, the codomain modulo this image. That's the co-kernel of H0 of pi. Okay. This is a measure of surjectivity. Okay. If it's zero, that means it's surjective. And so what you want to do is can you at least control the size of this co-kernel of H0 of pi if it's, if it's not surjective. Okay. If it's zero, it's, you want to make it small. If you can make it as small as possible, so it's zero, then it's subjective. But if not, can you make it small enough and control that? Okay. So these are the three questions that's very important in the study of coherent sheaves in algebraic geometry. Okay. And um, well, is there an answer to this? And the fairly decent answer is to use cohomology. And this is the thing that I'll be introducing in the rest of this playlist. I hope you enjoyed this adventure in pure mathematics.